Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons. I am your host, Carrie Parker. And today we have episode 272 for May 16th, 2022. And I've got a lot of stuff to cover today. We've got a news show. Unfortunately, most of it is bad. Um, yeah, you know, that's, that's, I guess, the way this stuff goes. If it wasn't for that, I'd be out of a job. So we've got a lot of news to cover today. But I've got some other fun stuff, too. Uh, I've got a brand new, big, new patron promotion starting today. And, you know, hey, even if you haven't considered being a patron before, but please check this one out. Like, listen to that at the end of the show, because I've got some really fun new stuff that I'm doing. I've really kind of gone to great lengths to try to make this as beneficial as possible for my patrons. And I've added some really fun new stuff. So uh, be sure to check that out uh, at the end of the show for more details. And if you become a patron, you'll get one of my super cool challenge coins. And these things are cool. I mean, I've had many people tell me who collect challenge coins themselves, either because they're military or uh, maybe law enforcement or something. That's kind of where these things tend to uh, proliferate. Tell me that this is one of the best coins they've ever gotten. I mean, in terms of like quality. So anyway, check that out. I'll talk more about that at the end of the show. Also, I just wanted to point out, I got a really nice review. I just ran across a really nice review of my book from someone named Odin Halverson. And uh, there's a link in the show notes. I'm not going to read it all here, um, but he, he did a really nice job reviewing the book. And so I wanted to say thank you. Now, I will note that even though we have a new show today, and there's been a lot of articles recently about uh, passwordless authentication, uh, I guess because May 5th was International Password Day, I, I don't know who gets to make these things up. But it was also Cinco de Mayo, and that's kind of where I was more focused. <laughs> but uh, anyway, there was a lot of uh, articles about that, and it's it's an interesting thing, uh, and I wanted to talk about it. And I did uh, in an interview that I just recorded with the VP from Ubico, the company that makes YubiKeys. And so we talk a lot about that. So I will hold off on discussing that until then, because, man, I've got plenty of other things to cover. So uh, today in the news, we're going to talk about a really important update for your HP computers. If you own an HP computer of any sort, uh, you're going to want to update your BIOS here very soon. There's a lot of high uh, severity vulnerabilities there affecting over 200 different models of HP computer. Then I'm going to read you an article that's very concerning about Chinese hackers stealing what they're saying is perhaps even trillions of dollars worth of intellectual property from over 30 multinational companies. It's really scary stuff. And uh, we probably won't feel the uh, the effects of that for many years, but it could be profound. Then I'm going to read an article about some popular websites, many of the top 100,000 websites out there, who are actually stealing form data, even if you never click submit. And this is something I've talked about before, but I think it's a good thing to talk about again. And so I saw this article and thought that would be a good opportunity to bring that back up. I got a short blurb about Clearview AI, a small victory there, one piece of good news uh, uh, this week. And that is that they are cutting back on some of the sales of their super creepy facial recognition software in the United States. They ran up against some privacy laws and lost. The European Union, uh, the EU Commission in particular, has put forth a proposal Again, one of the four horsemen of surveillance technology, basically, and that is, you know, do it for the kids. Uh, There's another CSAM proposal coming out of the EU that is super, super troubling, and uh, lots of articles on, about that, and I'm going to read you one from the Electronic Frontier Foundation, but I'm also going to read a little Twitter thread from Matthew Green, who has some rather pointed things to say about it, and... Uh, Again, I, I try to make the show not political because the things we talk about here transcend politics, in my view. Uh, this is not left or right. It's not liberal or conservative or however you want to divide <laughs> divide our planet. But uh, whatever you think about abortion rights, the fact that we in the United States may be losing a federal right to an abortion all of a sudden brings into highlight how important your data is and what it might mean, in particular, in this case, apps that track your period, which you probably didn't think much about now, but could have some significant implications going forward. Also, I'm going to talk to you about some new mobile surveillance going on. Uh, that has to do with these self-driving cars that are coming. I mean, all of our cars are going to be self-driving at some point, I, I firmly believe. It's going to take a while to get it figured out, but we will. 
But in the meantime, we've got all these cars that are outfitted with lots and lots of cameras, uh, including just regular old EVs like Teslas and things uh, are coming with lots of cameras built in. And a lot of cars are also connected to the internet, whether you paid for that service or not, because they're uploading telemetry data to the company, which it uses for its own purposes. But when you combine all these things together, you've got these roving surveillance vehicles. Anyway, I've got an article that explains why this is going to be a new frontier in mass surveillance. Facebook has decided to discontinue its nearby friends and some other location-based features. We don't know why, but I'm glad they are. And I'll update you about that. The Centers for Disease Control in the United States uh, solicited a lot of location data from third-party companies to track COVID-related things, but they may be using it for other things as well. And again, just another reason that all this private data collection is enabling government entities to make an end run around the Fourth Amendment. And then I'll read another disturbing article from The Verge about how mental health apps actually have horrible privacy protections. And finally, an article from Bloomberg about how the FBI has searched for data on millions of Americans without warrants. So there's a lot to talk about today. Let's get to the news. First up, just a quick note here about uh, HP computers, if you happen to have one. I'm not going to read all the details, but uh, there will, of course, be a link in the show notes that if you have an HP computer, you definitely are going to want to check out and make sure you get updated. Uh, this is from TechSpot, and real, real quickly, it just says, As reported by Bleeping Computer, HP has issued an advisory over potential security vulnerabilities that could allow arbitrary code execution with kernel privileges, which would enable hackers to access a device's BIOS and plant malware that can't be removed by traditional antivirus software or reinstalling the operating system. Both of the vulnerabilities have a high severity CVSS score of 8.8 .8 out of 10. HB hasn't revealed any technical details about the vulnerabilities. The extensive list of devices affected by the vulnerabilities includes business notebook PCs such as the Elite Dragonfly and several uh, Elite Books and Pro Books, business desktop PCs including the Elite Desk and Elite One, retail point of sale PCs like the Engage, desktop workstation PCs, Z1 and Z2 lines, and four thin client PCs. You can see a complete list of affected HP devices and the corresponding soft packs here. Uh, and of course, that's a link in the article, which you can get to if you follow the show notes. Uh, and it does say not all of them have been received the updates yet. So I'm not sure how many consumer models this uh, affects, but you're going to probably want to check if you've got an HP computer just to be sure. Next up is an article from CBS News about Chinese hackers getting tons and tons of intellectual property, including military technology, from over 30 multinational companies. From the article, it says, A years-long malicious cyber operation spearheaded by the notorious Chinese state actor APT-41, and uh, APT stands for Advanced Persistent Threat, I believe, kind of the generic term for state-sponsored hacker groups. Anyway, APT41 has siphoned off an estimated trillions in intellectual property theft from approximately 30 multinational companies within the manufacturing, energy, and pharmaceutical sectors. A new report by Boston-based cybersecurity firm Cyber Reason has unearthed a malicious campaign dubbed Operation Cuckoo Bees. God, I don't know who I, I don't know who names these things. Exfiltrated hundreds of gigabytes of intellectual property and sensitive data, including blueprints, diagrams, formulas, and manufacturing-related proprietary data from multiple intrusions spanning technology and manufacturing companies in North America, Europe, and Asia. This is a quote from uh, the CEO of Cyber Reason, Lior Div. And he says, quote, We're talking about blueprint diagrams of fighter jets, helicopters, and missiles. In pharmaceuticals, we saw them stealing IP of drugs around diabetes, obesity, and depression, unquote. The campaign has not yet stopped. Cyber criminals were focused on obtaining blueprints of cutting-edge technologies, the majority of which were not yet patented, Div said. The intrusion also exfiltrated data from the energy industry, including designs for solar panel and edge vacuum system technology. Another quote from Davey says, this is not technology that you have at home. It's what you need for large-scale manufacturing plants, unquote. 
The report doesn't disclose a list of affected companies, but researchers found the cyber espionage campaign, which had been operating undetected since at least early 2019, collected information that could be used for future cyber attacks or for potential extortion campaigns. Details about companies' business units, network architecture, user accounts and credentials, employee emails, and customer data. APT41, or Winti, which also goes by affiliate names Barium and Blackfly, remains one of the most prolific and successful Chinese state-sponsored threat groups, with a history of launching CCP-backed espionage activity and financially motivated attacks on, on U.S. and other international targets, routinely aligned with China's five-year economic development plans. In May 2021, the Justice Department charged four Chinese nationals connected to APT-41 for their participation in a global computer intrusion campaign targeting intellectual property and sensitive business information. The FBI estimated in its report that the annual cost to the U.S. economy of counterfeit goods, pirated software, and theft of trade secrets is between $225 billion and $600 billion. But researchers from Cyber Reason say it's hard to estimate the exact economic impacts of Operation Cuckoo Bees due to the complexity, stealth, and sophistication of the attacks, as well as the long-term impact of robbing multinational companies of research and development building blocks. Another quote from Div, he says, quote, In our assessment, we believe that we're talking about trillions, not billions. The real impact is something we're going to see in five years from now, ten years from now, when we think that we have the upper hand on pharmaceutical, energy, and defense technologies. And we're going to look at China and say, how did they bridge the gap so quickly without the engineers and resources, unquote. The FBI has consistently warned that China poses the largest counterintelligence threat to the U.S. And this is a quote from FBI Director Christopher Wray. He says, quote, China has a bigger hacking program than that of every other major nation combined. And their biggest target is, of course, the United States, unquote. Ray says that the FBI opens a new China counterintelligence investigation every 12 hours. Last year, the U.S. government attributed a massive attack targeting Microsoft Exchange servers to the Chinese state actors. And one more quote from Ray, he says, quote, Across the Chinese state and pretty much every major city, they have thousands of either Chinese government or Chinese government contracted hackers who spend all day with a lot of funding and very sophisticated tools trying to figure out how to hack into companies' networks to try to steal their trade secrets, unquote. So that that just blew me away. Um, I mean, you know this is happening. Honestly, you know we're doing it too. I mean, we being the United States in my case. Uh, you know, this espionage is something that countries do. It Sometimes it's political, sometimes it's... Uh, often financial. Um, in this case, it's you know China trying to get as much information on products and manufacturing and other techniques, including military stuff, that they can get their hands on, saving them a whole lot of time, effort, and money from uh, doing it themselves. Uh, but I'm, I'm sure the United States does this as well. Uh, we're probably trying to hack them too, but nevertheless, this is still very, very eye-opening. All right, so this next article... <laughs> it's something I've talked about before, uh, but it really brings home how important this is and how careful we've got to be with what we do on the web. So this is from Wired Magazine. It says, when you sign up for a newsletter, make a hotel reservation, or check out online, you probably take for granted that if you mistype your email address three times or change your mind and X out of the page, it doesn't matter. Nothing actually happens until you hit the submit button, right? Well, maybe not. As with so many assumptions about the web, this isn't always the case, according to new research. A surprising number of websites are collecting some or all of your data as you type it into a digital form. Research from KU uh, Leuven, uh, Rabaud University, and University of Luzanne crawled and analyzed the top 100,000 websites looking at scenarios in which a user is visiting a site while in the European Union and visiting a site from the United States. They found that 1,844 websites gathered an EU user's email address without their consent, and a staggering 2,950 logged a U.S. user's email in some form. Some of the sites seemingly do not intend to conduct the data logging, but incorporate third-party marketing and analytics services that cause the behavior. And I'm, again, I'm probably going to butcher this name. This is from Gunesh Akar, or Akar, a professor and researcher at Raboud University's Digital Security Group and one of the leaders of the study. He says, quote, if there's a submit button on a form, the reasonable expectation is, is that it does something, that it will submit your data when you click it. 
We were super surprised by these results. We thought maybe we were going to find a few hundred websites where your email is collected before you submit, but this exceeded our expectations by far, unquote. The researchers who will present their findings at the Usenix Security Conference in August say they were inspired to investigate what they call leaky forms by media reports, particularly from Gizmodo, about third parties collecting form data regardless of submission status. They point out that, at its core, the behavior is similar to so-called keyloggers, which are typically malicious programs that log everything a target types. But on a mainstream top 1,000 site, users probably won't expect to have their information keylogged. And in practice, the researchers see a few variations of the behavior. Some sites log the data keystroke by keystroke, but many grabbed complete submissions from one field when users clicked to the next. And this is a quote from Asuman Senol, a privacy and identity researcher at the KU uh, Leuven, uh, and one of the co-authors. He says, quote, In some cases, when you click the next field, they collect the previous one. Like you click the password field and they collect the email. Or you just click anywhere and they collect all the information immediately. We didn't expect to find thousands of websites. And in the U.S., the numbers are really high, which is interesting, unquote. The researchers say that the regional differences may be related to companies being more cautious about user tracking and even potentially integrating with fewer third parties because of the EU's General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR. But they emphasize that this is just one possibility and the study didn't examine the explanations for the disparity. Since completing their paper, the group also had a discovery about Metapixel, Meta being Facebook, and TikTok Pixel, invisible marketing trackers that services embed on their websites to track users, users across the web and show them ads. Both claimed in their documentation that a customer could turn on, quote unquote, automatic advanced matching, which would trigger data collection when a user submitted a form. In practice, though, the researchers found that these tracking pixels were grabbing hashed email addresses an obscured version of the email address used to identify web users across platforms before submission. For U.S. users, 8,438 sites may have been leaking data to Meta, Facebook's parent company, through pixels, and 7,379 sites may be impacted for EU users. For, t for the TikTok pixel, the group found 154 sites for U.S. users and 147 for EU users. The researchers filed a bug report for, with Meta on March 25th, and the company quickly assigned an engineer to the case, but the group has not heard an update since. The research notified TikTok on April 21st, they discovered the TikTok behavior more recently, and have not heard back. Meta and TikTok did not immediately return Wired's request for comment about the findings. And this is one more quote from Akar. Akar. He says, uh, quote, The privacy risks for users are that they will be tracked even more efficiently. They can be tracked across different websites, across different sessions, across mobile and desktop. An email address is such a useful identifier for tracking because it's global, it's unique, and it's constant. You can't clear it like you can clear cookies. It's a powerful identifier, unquote. Yeah, so I want to circle back to one thing the article said about collecting hashed email addresses. So I've discussed uh, cryptographic hashes in the past. It's a one-way function. It takes some amount of text in, does some cryptographic munging on that data, and spits out. Uh, kind of a big number, basically. Uh, it looks like gobbledygook. But the key thing here is that if I put that email address in again to this algorithm, I get the same result. So if I hash somebody's email uh, and get this kind of fingerprint of their email, then I can use that fingerprint to find that same email somewhere else. So basically, my guess is it's some way for them to claim that they are being privacy preserving. They didn't actually collect your email address, but they collected a fingerprint of your email address, which means that if you enter that email somewhere else, or if they find that email somewhere else and they hash it as well, they now know that you are the same person. So it's used again for tracking. But the upshot of this whole thing is, this, this whole article, is that there's a lot of fancy code running in web pages with JavaScript these days. I mean, they're, those web pages are running software code. And some of the things that that software code is doing is potentially collecting information that you put in form fields before you ever hit, hit the submit button. And I, I'm sure that a lot of this is being done by third party uh, APIs and SDKs that some of these websites are using, they probably don't even know this is happening. They sign up for Google Analytics or Facebook Analytics of some sort, and they so they use a little plugin that helps them do some really cool stuff on their website. Unknowingly, those plugins are then stealing this data and reporting it back to someone else. And it can be really hard to know this. I mean, you know, it's probably listed in some sort of policy thing or 
end user license agreement or whatever when you use this free plugin to do something cool on your website. Uh, and and then not realizing that what's going on under the covers is that you're basically giving them an excuse to rob your customers of information that they can use for other purposes. So just realize that when you type stuff into a web page, that information may be getting stored somewhere. And here's something that, that I've, I admit that I've done in the past. When was the last time that you accidentally put your password in the wrong field? Like you're on some web page page and and you thought that it was looking for your password when really it was looking for a PID code or something. And so you enter your password and you you see it, you paste it, but oh crap, it's not dot, 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 like those little, you know, it's not hidden with little circles or asterisks or something. Uh, it's right there. It's like out here, your password is right there for anyone to see and you, and, but you don't hit submit and you think, you know, I could just delete that. And phew, that was a close one. Well, <laughs> I'm here to tell you that that information may have been copied anyway. But just in general, I mean, I mean I, I've gone through many forms where I start filling out a form, you know, to sign up for something on a website. And I finally get to the point where they ask me some something that's just a bridge too far. And they ask me for some piece of data like, oh, come on, you got to be kidding me. And I just give up and I close the page and I go away thinking, well, you know, I didn't actually click submit. So they never got any of that data. Well, we now know that that <laughs> that may not be the case. They may have gotten that information anyway. So if you're interested, there is a, a plugin that these guys used called Leaky Forms Inspector. And it's a plugin you can use on your browser that will actually alert you to websites that are doing this. If you're curious, uh, go to the show notes. I've got a link to that plugin. Okay, now just a quick update on Clearview AI, the really creepy company that is scouring the web for pictures of anybody they can find, including stuff on Facebook and LinkedIn and other places, and scraping all that data and creating this massive, massive database of people by faces and selling this supposedly to quote unquote good guys, uh, law enforcement and government agencies uh, looking for terrorists, of course, and really bad people. And of course, it's it's been abused and for other reasons. But anyway, uh, they suffered a setback, which is good for us, or at least if you happen to live in Illinois. But let me read a, uh, an excerpt from this article from Engadget. And it says, Notorious facial recognition company Clearview AI has agreed to permanently halt sales of its massive biometric database to all private companies and individuals in the United States as a part of a legal settlement with the American Civil Liberties Union per court records. And again, that was private companies and individuals, what they kind of said they were not, what were doing anyway, but apparently they were. Monday's announcement, and this would have been, I think, May 9th, marks the close of a two-year legal dispute brought by the ACLU and privacy advocate groups in May of 2020 against the company over allegations that, had, that it had violated BIPA, the 2008 Illinois Biometric Information Privacy Act. This act requires companies to obtain permission before harvesting a person's biometric information, fingerprints, gait metrics, in other words, how you walk, iris scans, and face prints, for example, and empowers users to sue the companies who do not. In addition to the nationwide private party sales ban, Clearview will not offer any of its services to Illinois local and state law enforcement agencies, as well as all, as well as all the private parties, for the next five years. Now, why they stopped that at five, I don't know. Anyway, that's not all. Clearview must also end its free trial program for police officers, erect and maintain an opt-out page for Illinois residents, and spend $50,000 advertising it online. The settlement must still be approved by a federal judge before it takes effect. Fingers crossed there. Monday's settlement is the latest in a long line of privacy lawsuits and regulatory actions against the company. Clearview AI was slapped with a 20 million euro fine by Italian regulators in March and a 17 million pound fine in November by the UK, both for violations of national data privacy laws. Australia has been investigating the company's scraping schemes since 2020, and currently, a small group of U.S. lawmakers are lobbying to ban federal agencies from using Clearview services entirely. But given that the company boasted in February that it had amassed 100 billion images in its quote-unquote index of faces, their right to anonymity in America remains deeply in peril. And I'm not sure why they singled out America there. This is a worldwide program. So, yeah, anyway, these guys are doing... <sighs> doing horrible things, but it's just not surprising. I mean, if you collect this data, someone's got to use it for these kind of purposes. All right, next up, the EU um, has a new proposal, again, to save the children. Yeah, I don't mean to sound snarky. I, I, obviously, I, I care about kids. I've got two of my own. Child sexual abuse is absolutely abhorrent. 
and you know we need to do what we need to do to stop it but we can't be trampling on privacy rights in order to do that and this new proposal by the eu commission is just horrid so i'm going to read you two different things here i'm going to read you a, a bit of an article from the electronic frontier foundation who have not surprisingly come out against this um, but i'm also want to read some very frank posts from uh, a guy named matthew green a crypto expert um, from his twitter account uh, so let's start with the eff verbiage first it says the executive body of the European Union published today, and I think this was May 11th, a legislative proposal, and there's a link to the text if you want to find it in this article, that if it became law, would be a disaster for online privacy in the EU and throughout the world. In the name of fighting crimes against children, the EU Commission has suggested new rules that would compel a broad range of internet services, including hosting and messaging services, to search for and report child abuse material. The Commission's new demands would require regular, plain text access to users' private messages, from email to texting to social media. Private companies would be tasked not just with finding and stopping distribution of known child abuse images, but could also be required to take action to prevent quote-unquote grooming or suspected future child abuse. This would be a massive new surveillance system because it would require the infrastructure for detailed analysis of user messages. The new proposal is overbroad, not proportionate, and hurts everyone's privacy and safety. By damaging encryption, it would actually make the problem of child safety worse, not better, for some minors. Abused minors, as much as anyone, need private channels to report what is happening to them. The scanning requirements are subject to safeguards, but they aren't strong enough to prevent the privacy-intrusive actions that platforms will, will be required to undertake. The European Union prides itself on high standards for data protection and privacy, as demonstrated by the adoption of the GDPR. This new proposal suggests the EU may head in a dramatically different direction, giving up on privacy and instead seeking state-controlled scanning of all messages. Fortunately, the misguided proposal published today is far from the final word on this matter. The European Commission cannot make law on its own. We don't think the EU wants to cancel everyday people's privacy and security, and we are ready to work together with members of the European Parliament and EU member states' representatives to defend privacy and encryption. Now, I, didn't, I don't think I've ever done this, but I, I ran across this thread from Matthew Green, somebody, by the way, who I've tried to get on the show before, and he's a hard man to reach. But nevertheless, I have great respect for this, for this person, and uh, he wrote this on his Twitter stream. This document is the most terrifying thing I've ever seen. It is proposing a new mass surveillance system that will read private text messages, not to detect CSAM, but to detect grooming. And here he posts a, a clip, I think, from the proposal. I'm, I'm going to read this. It's a little bit hard to read. It doesn't flow very well. So forgive me if I trip a little bit. But here's a quote uh, that he pasted. It says, as mentioned, detecting grooming would have a positive impact on the fundamental rights of potential victims, especially by contributing to the prevention of abuse. If swift action is taken, it may even prevent a child from suffering harm. At the same time, the detection process is generally speaking the most intrusive one for users compared to the detection and, uh, of the dissemination of known and new sexual child abuse material, since it requires automatically scanning through texts in interpersonal communications. It's important to bear in mind in this regard that such scanning is often the only possible way to detect it and the technology used does not, quote unquote, understand the content of the communication, but rather looks for known pre-identified patterns that indicate potential grooming. Detection technologies have also already acquired a high degree of accuracy. Although human oversight and review remain necessary and indicators of grooming are becoming ever more reliable with time as the algorithms learn. All right, that's, so that's the end of the quote from what I believe is the, the proposal. So now let me go back to what Matthew was saying. Let me be clear what this means. To detect grooming is not simply searching for known CSAM. It isn't using AI to detect new CSAM, which is also on the table. It's running algorithms reading your actual text messages to figure out what you're saying at scale. It is potentially going to do this on encrypted messages that should be private. It won't be good, and it won't be smart, and it will make mistakes. And what's terrifying is that once you open up, quote, machines reading your text messages, unquote, for any purpose, there are no limits. Here is the document. It's long but worth reading. And of course, he's linking to the article here. But it describes the most sophisticated mass surveillance machinery ever deployed outside of China and the USSR. Not an exaggeration. 
By legally mandating the construction of these surveillance systems in Europe, the European government will ultimately make these capabilities available to every government. Have to give the EU credit for going maximally creepy and for demanding the existence of technology we don't really have yet. Dear everyone, there is no abuse-resistant technology that can accurately read human conversations, quote-unquote, privately. It does not exist. Maybe in the year 2200, we'll be able to outsource crime prevention to a benevolent AI. Today, it is science fiction. So again, folks, just whenever you hear (laughs) politicians in particular screaming about how we must get access to everything to protect the kids, to stop terrorists, you know, these sorts of things, that should be an immediate red flag. Why not just say that we must have video surveillance inside everybody's homes? That would prevent a lot of crime, wouldn't it? I could go on, but I think you're getting the idea. So anyway, pay attention to these things as as they hit the news. And if you happen to be in a position to push back on on this, if if you are in the EU and you can write your representatives, please, please make your voices heard. All right, so let's move on. And this next one is not going to be much fun to talk about either. And again, I, I don't care where you stand specifically on the issue of abortion rights. You need to think about this article from a bigger picture view than that. I mean, replace abortion with guns, whatever, whatever it takes for you to understand that first things that were legal can become illegal. And two, all the massive amounts of data that we are giving up daily by these apps and services that are collecting it can really have significant consequences when these things change. So again, as, as I read this article, try not to be political about it. Try to think about it in the bigger sense. Okay. This particular article, and, and there were several, but this particular one is from NPR and it says, In the wake of the leaked draft Supreme Court opinion that would overturn Roe v. Wade, privacy experts are increasingly concerned about how data collected from period tracking apps, among other applications, could potentially be used to penalize anyone seeking or considering an abortion. Millions of people use apps to help track their menstrual cycles. Flow, which bills itself as the most popular period and cycle tracking app, has amassed 43 million active users. Another app, Clue, claims 12 million monthly active users. The personal health data stored in those apps is among the most intimate types of information a person can share. And it can also be telling. The apps can show when their period stops and starts and when a pregnancy stops and starts. That has privacy experts on edge because if abortion is ever criminalized, this data, whether subpoenaed or sold to a third party, could be used to suggest that someone has had or is considering an abortion. This is a quote from Lydia Brown. She's a policy counsel with the Privacy and Data Project at the Center for Democracy and Technology. And she says, quote, We are very concerned in a lot of advocacy spaces about what happens when private corporations or the government can gain access to deeply sensitive data about people's lives and activities, especially when that data could put people in vulnerable and marginalized communities at risk for actual harm, unquote. At least 26 states are certain or likely to ban abortions if the Supreme Court overturns Roe v. Wade, according to the Guttmacher Institute, a research group that supports abortion rights. But some states have signaled an interest to go further. Two days after the leaked Supreme Court opinion was first reported by Politico, lawmakers in Louisiana advanced a bill that would classify abortion as a homicide. Evan Greer, director of the digital rights advocacy group Fight for the Future, says period apps aren't the only ways technology can be used to connect someone to an abortion. If someone is sitting in the waiting room of a clinic that offers abortion services and is playing a game on their phone, that app might be collecting location data, she says. And a quote from Greer, she says, quote, Any app that is collecting sensitive information about your health or your body should be given an additional level of scrutiny, unquote. Search histories can also be identifying, says Brown. Activist groups, regardless of what they're advocating for, might try to purchase a data set that would show where people have been searching for information related to abortion. That information could be used for predatory advertising, according to Brown, but could also offer a way for private citizens to report another person for seeking an abortion. This could be especially risky in Texas, they added, given the state's controversial new abortion law known as SB8. The law bans abortion as soon as cardiac activity is detectable, typically around six weeks. 
It also empowers private citizens to enforce the ban through payments of at least $10,000 for anyone who successfully sues an abortion provider. And according to Brown, she says, quote, anybody could get their hands on this data by simply purchasing it from a company that is already collecting it, unquote. It's not uncommon for apps to cooperate with law enforcement during criminal investigations, oftentimes around child exploitative imagery in particular. If abortion is criminalized, experts say period tracking data could become a target for investigators, all of which makes an app's privacy policies especially important. But when it comes to privacy, these policies can be vague and in flux, according to Andrea Ford, a research fellow at the University of Edinburgh. And this is a quote from Ford. She says, quote, it becomes really muddy when you get into abortion. If that were to become illegal in certain places, does that transcend the right to privacy that is written into the contracts in the way that child trafficking would, unquote? For those second-guessing their period-tracking app, Ford says there's a risk-versus-convenience calculation that's different for each user. It depends in large part on where you live and what the laws are. Ford says, quote, If I lived in a state where abortion was actively being criminalized, I would not use a period tracker. That's for sure, unquote. If police are interested in data stored on a user's device, they would need a warrant, which has a, quote, much higher legal bar, unquote, than a subpoena, Greer says. But if the data is in the cloud and owned by a company, a subpoena would be necessary to access the data. Ford says the most secure option might just be the most old-fashioned, tracking your cycle on paper. So again, I I know this is a really touchy issue. I don't want to get into (laughs) the abortion debate itself. But this just goes to show how dangerous all this data collection can be if it's not well controlled. Things that seemed completely harmless yesterday can be horribly significant today, including at risk of physical harm in some cases. If you want to go further on this, there's actually a a longer EFF article that I've linked to in the show notes that has a lot of specific things that you might want to consider doing. Uh, A lot of this comes around to companies, you know, like Planned Parenthood or some of these other companies that might be, I mean, heck, at this point, it could even be Uber and Lyft, right? Because in Texas, If they drove you to Planned Parenthood where you're going to get an abortion, they could be held kind of liable in helping you to get that abortion in Texas. And there was another article I don't have time to read um, about a company called SafeGraph, uh, which has been selling location information. uh, And apparently they have (laughs) agreed, I don't know if that was because they were sued or what, but to stop selling location data of people who are visiting Planned Parenthood. But anyway, but that's a longer story. Again, you can find a link to that article in the show notes if you want to read that one. All right, let's move on. Uh, This is from Vice Magazine, and it's about San Francisco police using driverless cars as mobile surveillance cameras. It says, for the last five years, driverless car companies have been testing their vehicles on public roads. These vehicles constantly roam neighborhoods while laden with a variety of sensors, including video cameras capturing everything going on around them in order to operate safely and analyze instances where they don't. While the companies themselves, such as Alphabet's Waymo and General Motors' Cruise, tout the potential transportation benefits their services may one day offer, they don't publicize another use case, one that is far less hypothetical. Mobile surveillance cameras for police departments. And this is a quote from a San Francisco Police Department training document that was obtained by Motherboard. It says, quote, Autonomous vehicles are recording the surroundings continuously and have the potential to help with investigative leads. Investigations has already done this several times, unquote. The document released to Motherboard is a three-page guide for how officers should interact with autonomous vehicles, or AVs, especially ones that have no human driver inside. It outlines basic procedures such as how to interact with vehicles, and in parentheses it says, do not open the vehicle for non-emergency issues, and do not pull vehicles over unless a legitimate law enforcement action exists, as well as whether to issue a citation for a moving violation for a car with no human driver. And parenthetically, it says here, no citation can be issued at this time if the vehicle has no one in the driver's seat, but the incident report should be written instead. And the section titled Investigations has two bullet points advising officers on their usefulness in collecting footage. Privacy advocates say the revelation that police are actively using AV footage is cause for alarm. This is a quote from uh, Adam Schwartz at EFF, who I interviewed a long time ago. He's the senior staff attorney. He said cars in general are troves of personal consumer data, but autonomous vehicles will have even more of that data from capturing the details of the world around them. So when we see any police department identify AVs as a new source of evidence, that's very concerning, unquote. And this is a quote from Chris Gilliard, who's a visiting research fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School Shorenstein Center. And he says, quote, As companies continue to make public roadways their testing grounds for their vehicles, everyone should understand them for what they are, 
rolling surveillance devices that expand existing widespread spying technologies. Law enforcement agencies already have access to automated license plate readers, geofence warrants, ring doorbell footage, as well as ability to purchase location data. This practice will extend the research of an already pervasive web of surveillance, unquote. Privacy advocates and researchers have long warned about the implications of increasingly sophisticated cars, but many of these warnings are essentially extensions of the privacy concerns of smartphones, where consumer technology tracks your movements and behavior and anonymizes it and sells it to third parties in a manner that can be reverse engineered to identify individuals. They rarely imagine a scenario where the cars on the road are constantly recording the world around them for later use by police departments. It is the combination of using fixed location camera networks with rolling networks of autonomous vehicle cameras and data that scares privacy advocates most. Another quote from EFF's Schwartz, he says, quote, The holistic output of these combined moving and fixed networks is a threat that is greater than the sum of its parts. Working together, they can more effectively turn our lives into open books, unquote. So, yeah, that's a thing. (laughs) These cars are chock full of sensors. Uh, including lots of video cameras, like usually at least four, and they're constantly recording everything and storing that data. And basically what we're seeing is that that data is already being looked at by law enforcement agents. So it's, you know, a a surveillance state thing, basically. And and there's more than just these cars doing it. Uh, It's not just these driverless autonomous vehicles that are out there doing this. Many modern cars today have cameras all over them and transmit some of that data uh, up to the cloud. Uh, where it could be stored and, again, accessed by anybody, including law enforcement. All right, next up, a brief good note about Facebook, I guess. This is from 9to5Mac. It says, Facebook on Thursday began informing its users that nearby friends, that's in, that's capitalized, I guess that's a feature they have, and other location-based features will soon be discontinued at the end of the month. While the reasons are currently unclear, the company claims that all information related to these features will be deleted from Facebook servers. Users have been getting a notification in the Facebook app for iOS and Android about the end of Nearby Friends, a feature that lets people share their current location with other Facebook friends. At the same time, Facebook also says that time alerts, location history, and background location are also, quote-unquote, going away soon. According to the company, Nearby Friends and other location-based features will no longer be available to users after May 31st, 2022. And I guess this is a quote from Facebook that says, Nearby Friends and weather alerts will no longer be available after May 31st, 2022. Information you shared that was used for these experiences, including location history and background location, will stop being collected after May 31st, 2022, even if you have previously enabled them. Back to the article, it says some of the data, such as the user's location history, which automatically uses your location to create a map of places you have visited, will be available for download by August 1st, 2022. After that, Facebook says that this data will be deleted. Unfortunately, this doesn't mean that Facebook's app will stop collecting users' location. The company states that location data will still be collected, quote, for other experiences, unquote. Of course, you can always disable the Facebook app's access to your location by going into the iOS privacy settings. And notice that said iOS. I don't know if that's possible on Android, if that's what that's implying. But yeah, you can limit or completely stop access to your location, uh, at least on iOS, in the Facebook app by going to your privacy settings. All right, just a few more quick articles here. Uh, This one's from Vice again. And it's about the CDC tracking people. Uh, It says the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, or the CDC here uh, here in the United States, bought access to location data harvested from tens of millions of phones in the United States to, to perform analysis of compliance with curfews, track patterns of people visiting K through 12 schools, and specifically monitor the effectiveness of policy in the Navajo Nation, according to CDC documents obtained by Motherboard. The documents also show that Although the CDC used COVID-19 as a reason to buy access to the data more quickly, it intended to use it for more general CDC purposes. Location data is information on a device's location sourced from the phone, which can then show where a person lives, works, and where they went. The sort of data the CDC bought was aggregated, meaning it was designed to follow trends that emerged from the movements of groups of people. But researchers have repeatedly raised concerns with how location data can be de-anonymized and used to track specific people. The CDC used the data for monitoring curfews with the document saying that SafeGraphs, there's that name again, SafeGraphs data, quote, 
has been critical for ongoing response efforts such as hourly monitoring of activity in curfew zones or detailed counts of visits to participating pharmacies for vaccine monitoring, unquote. Zach Edwards, a cybersecurity researcher who closely follows the data marketplace, told Motherboard in an online chat after reviewing the documents, quote, The CDC seems to have purposefully created an open-ended list of use cases which included monitoring curfews, neighbor-to-neighbor visits, visits to churches, schools, and pharmacies, and also a variety of analysis with this data specifically focused on, quote-unquote, violence. And then parenthetically, and finally, it says the document doesn't stop at churches, it mentions places of worship. So I've got mixed feelings on this one, I gotta say. Collecting of data by itself isn't horrible. There are certainly cases where uses of data like this, especially in a truly anonymized and aggregated way, can be used for the benefit of the public in general without violating an individual person's privacy. That, I'm sure, is what they're trying to do here. But nevertheless... (sighs) The problem is we just don't do a good job with our data in this country. We we don't have regulations around it, for one thing. And we're just really bad about anonymizing our data. And location data in particular can be hard to anonymize. And conversely, can be easy to re-identify. And you can tell an awful lot about somebody based on their location. And you can find out things about somebody that they probably would prefer were not known. All right, moving on. Uh, yet another case of... Apps on our phones giving up way too much data and not protecting it. This is from The Verge. As a category, mental health apps have worse privacy protections for users than most other types of apps, according to a new analysis from researchers at Mozilla. And that's the company that makes Firefox, by the way. Prayer apps also had poor privacy standards, the team found. And this is a quote from uh, Jen uh, Kaltreiter, who is the uh, the guide lead for Mozilla's really cool uh, report called Privacy Not Included. And uh, she says, quote, the vast majority of mental health and prayer apps are exceptionally creepy. They track, share, and capitalize on users' most intimate personal thoughts and feelings like moods, mental state, and biometric data, unquote. In the latest iteration of the guide, and there's a link to this guide and this report in the show notes, it says the team analyzed 32 mental health and prayer apps. Of those apps, 29 were given a privacy not included warning label in indicating that the team had concerns about how the app managed user data. The apps are designed for sensitive issues like mental health conditions, yet collect large amounts of personal data under vague privacy policies, the team said in the statement. Most apps also had poor security practices, letting users create accounts with weak passwords despite containing deeply personal information. The apps with the worst practices, according to Mozilla, are BetterHelp, Youper, that's Y-O-U-P-E-R, Wobot, W-O-E-B-O-T, Better Stop Suicide, Pray.com, and Talkspace. The AI chatbot Wobot, for example, says it collects information about users from third parties and shares user information for advertising purposes. Therapy provider Talkspace collects user chat transcripts. The Mozilla team said in a statement that it reached out to the companies behind these apps to ask about their policies multiple times, but only three responded. In-person, traditional mental health care can be hard for many people to find. Most therapists have long waiting lists, and navigating insurance and costs can be a major barrier to care. The problem got worse during the COVID-19 pandemic when more and more people started to need care. Mental health apps sought to fill that void by making resources more accessible and readily available. But that access could come with a privacy trade-off, the report shows. And this is a quote from Mozilla's researcher Misha Rykoff, and says, quote, They operate like data-sucking machines with a mental health app veneer. In other words, a wolf in sheep's clothing, unquote. So I don't think there's a whole lot more to be said about that. I think the the situation there is pretty clear. Obviously, mental health is something, I think in particular in the United States, that we do not take seriously enough. Uh, We certainly don't cover it well enough under our insurance plans. Uh, There's still a lot of stigma associated with it, which is just awful. It's part of your health like any other part of your health. And so if you need help, absolutely seek it out. But you've got to beware when you're using apps like this, what kind of information uh, you give it and you need to review their privacy policies, which are honestly probably too hard to find and read and understand. But at least be aware that again, without any regulations saying otherwise, that information may not be protected. All right, one more quick uh, blurb here from Bloomberg. 
uh, about FBI data searches. And it says, the FBI searched emails, texts, and other electronic communications of as many as 3.4 million U.S. residents without a warrant over a year, the nation's top spy chief said in a report. The quote-unquote queries were made between December 2020 and November 2021 by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, or the FBI, personnel as they looked for signs of threats and terrorists within electronic data legally collected under the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, or FISA, according to an annual transparency report issued Friday by the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, or DNI. The surge came as the FBI made a push to stop hacking attempts, but the American Civil Liberties Union called it an invasion of privacy, quote, on an enormous scale, unquote. And this is a quote from Ashley Gorski, a senior staff attorney with the ACLU. Um, and Al Ashley says, quote, Today's report sheds light on the extent of these unconstitutional backdoor searches and underscores the urgency of the problem. It's past time for Congress to step in to protect Americans' Fourth Amendment rights, end quote. And that, of course, is the right against unreasonable search and seizure. The article goes on, the, the authority the FBI used in this case was under Section 702 of FISA, which is set to expire at the end of next year unless it's renewed by Congress. The report doesn't say the activity was illegal or even wrong, but the revelation could renew congressional and public debates over the power U.S. agencies have to collect and review intelligence information, especially data concerning individuals. In comparison, few, fewer than 1.3 million queries involving Americans' data were conducted between December 2019 and November 2020, according to the 38-page report. So if you're doing the math there, that is almost three times as much the year after that. Okay, so that is the news, and I don't really have, I don't really have a news article that, that slides right into my tip of the week, but um, my tip of the week this week has to do with what's called Global Privacy Control, or GPC. Now, we are... We are tracked mercilessly all the time when we surf the web, either on our computer, on our smartphone, everywhere we go on the web, somebody, in fact, multiple somebodies are trying to track us, first parties and third parties. Marketers, you know, claim that there's ways to opt out of all these things that you've got the power all along, but practically speaking, that is a lie. I mean, it's just, it's just not practically possible. There are literally thousands of data brokers and on any given website, there could be dozens of things embedded in that web page that are trying to track you. There is just no way for you as a human to manually go and opt out of each of these places. You don't even know where to go in a lot of cases to find out who's tracking you to even know to ask. So wouldn't it be nice if there was some way that you could just communicate automatically to every website you go to, hey, I, I don't want to be tracked. And if that sounds familiar, it should because... <laughs> There many years ago, I think it was 2009, some researchers came up with this idea of, hey, why don't we just put a little flag, a little, a little bit into our web requests uh, that you can set on your web browser that will tell every website you go to, I don't want to be tracked. And it was called Do Not Track, DNT. But when this thing came out, the whole data collection industry was really starting to hum. And a lot of these marketing firms pushed back and said, you know, why should we respect this? And there was, of course, there wasn't and still isn't any sort of regulation that would cause them to comply with this request, at least not in the United States. So a lot of people jumped on this. There was a lot of, you know, news coverage about this. You know, this is the silver bullet. Everyone just needs to say, stop tracking me and this will all go away. And the W3C or the World Wide Web Consortium, which is the, well, the worldwide consortium that, that works on industry standards for uh, for the web, you know, got behind this and was trying to standardize this. And, you know, all the browser makers gave you the option to do this, but a lot of marketers were just blowing it off. And then in particular, there's one case where Microsoft decided to automatically turn that on to automatically assume that you did not want to be tracked. If you installed internet Explorer with the express install installation, which, you know, means don't show me a lot of stuff, just get it installed and get out of my way which is, of course, by far the way most people install their software these days. And that really caused a kerfuffle because now all these marketing firms could cry foul. And I think rightly so, because now it's no longer an affirmative choice by the user 
communicating that they don't want to be tracked. They didn't, you know, the user didn't go in and, and make a choice and say, hey, I, I want to let you know that I definitely do not want you to track me. This was a default thing. And as we've talked about the tyranny of the default before, most people don't even know the choice is there. And if it gets made for you, was that really a choice? So that really was, you know, maybe the straw that broke the camel's back. A lot of these marketers were saying, well, I'm definitely going to ignore it now because you didn't really ask the user this. You're, you made the choice for them. So it's not really their choice. So therefore, I'm going to ignore it. And of course, the other ironic twist of this whole thing was, uh, as you're sending information to all these websites, uh, if you include uh, this new flag that says do not track, that probably made you somewhat unique. And it turned out to be just yet another way that you could be fingerprinted uh, on the web and recognized, ironically. So anyway, do not track basically died, because nobody res was respecting it. And so it was kind of pointless. And this was right around the time that uh, the GDPR was coming online in Europe. And it seems like if it had just held a little bit longer, it might have succeeded because once we finally started getting some privacy regulations that basically said, hey, if a user affirmatively says, I don't want to be tracked, then you need to do certain things. You, you need to, to one degree or another, stop messing with their data. So now enter global privacy control. And as near as I can tell, honestly, it's really just do not track 2.0. I mean, it seems effectively the same thing. But now we have regulations, not just in the EU with GDPR, but actually in the United States, we have some states that have enacted privacy laws where, in, in particular, like in the CCPA, the, Cal the California Consumer Privacy Act, and the follow-up uh, CPRA, the, Cal uh, the California Privacy Rights Act, basically has explicit language around this flag, the, this new global privacy control flag. And it works the same way. Uh, it, it's you, something you set in your web browser that tells a website that you go to that you want to be tracked. So now, now we have regulations with teeth that say, hey, if, 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 the, if the user says this, then you have to respect it. Now, what it means to respect it is still kind of fuzzy. Like if they start seeing this for you, does that mean that I now from now on, I should stop tracking you? What about the data I already have on you? Uh, what if uh, I'm a marketer that has a presence on dozens of websites and I see this on one website, but not another, how, you know, how does, I mean, there's, as with all these kind of regulations, there's these, you know, these fuzzy cases and wiggle room and loopholes and whatever, but it, it's finally, it's finally has a chance uh, of succeeding. And so if you were one of those people that jumped on the DNT or the do not track bandwagon years ago and then got really upset when basically it didn't do anything, you might be thinking, okay, great. I'm, why do I, I'm not going to do that again. Fool me once, right? Kind of thing. But we actually do have some, some regulations out there now that may help you, even if you don't perhaps reside in some of those regions. So I am going to ask you to find and enable this thing and, and, Luckily, they've also got some new tools now that will help you uh, verify that you have done this correctly. So there is a website uh, for global privacy control, and it's easy to remember. It's just globalprivacycontrol.org, not .com, .org. And if you go to that website right now from, and I, you should do this actually from all of your devices that can surf the web, uh, any place you might be surfing the web. So that could be your phone, your tablet, your, your, uh, heck your TV in some cases can surf the web, uh, your laptops, your desktops, whatever. And if you go to that website, at the very top of that website is a little black banner at the top, and it has a little indicator there as to whether or not it is detecting your global privacy control signal. And it's either green or red, and it says it's either detected or not. And if it's detected, that means that that browser on that device is signaling to everyone, every website you go to, hey, I don't want to be tracked. And so how, how do you set this up? There's, there's a few ways to do it on, on your computer. Uh, you can run the brave browser. If you run the brave browser, there's nothing to be done by it's already on by default. And, and I, hopefully this isn't going to suffer the same problem that Microsoft internet Explorer did. I mean, brave's big thing is privacy, right? So you should be able to argue that if somebody is running the brave browser, that they care about privacy and that that was something they did on purpose. If you're running Firefox, you can turn it on by going to about colon config C-O-N-F-I-G, and you'll get a lot of warnings because there's a whole bunch of knobs and buttons and switches under the covers that you can tweak in Firefox. And if you mess one up, it actually could be a problem. So if you want to do that, you can do that. And there's links in the show notes uh, and in my blog article on this that will tell you how to do that. But I'm going to tell you an easier way. Uh, if you just install one of these three extensions, 
uh, it will automatically do this for you. You can install the DuckDuckGo browser extension for Firefox or Privacy Badger from the EFF or another one, honestly, I'd never heard of. It's kind of cute called Opt Me Out. And that's OPT, Opt. And, and, and Meow is spelled like a cat's meow. M E O W T, Meow, Opt Me Out. Anyway, um, if you install any of those three plugins in your browser, that will automatically send the GPC flag. Now, for mobile devices, you can use the DuckDuckGo browser on your mobile device or the Brave browser on your mobile device. Uh, if your mobile browser supports plugins, um, you can use the DuckDuckGo uh, plugin for your browser as well. And to check to see if it works, you just need to go back to that website, globalprivacycontrol.org, and look at the very top to see whether it's green or red. So I, again, I encourage you to do this um, if for no other reason than to declare to the world, literally, every place you visit, that privacy matters to you and you do not want your data collected. And now, because we have regulations and hopefully we will get more, and if we're really lucky in the U.S., we'll finally get a federal one, it will mean that those websites need to respect your choice. So there you have it. There's your news and your tip of the week. All right, everybody, thank you for tuning in. That was a long one. We had a lot of stuff to cover today. I know we're, we're running along already, so I want to make this quick. I will be talking about this more over the, uh, the coming few weeks anyway because this uh, new patron promotion is going to be going, going on for a while. And again, don't skip out just yet. Just hold on for a second. Hear me out. So I've been really working, uh, certainly since I've retired, to try to make being a patron really pay off. I've been trying to add some really cool new benefits that I think my patrons really enjoy. And so... There's a $2 benefit, which is basically, hey, I like what you do. I just want to support what you're doing. And for that, you will get my eternal gratitude. Uh, but there are two other levels. There's the castle guard level at 5 bucks and the knight errant level at 10 bucks that get some really cool new features. And I've been adding more of these in the last year or so, uh, and some just in the last month or so. So at the castle guard level, for example, you get bonus podcast content. And mostly for the interview weeks. Uh, so in other words, every other week on the on the weeks where I do interview shows, and it's usually just some extra questions that I throw at the at the interview guests, usually tangential to the, what we talked about, or maybe just about them, you know, how they got to being where they are, you know, what their origin story was, or some really interesting story they may have. So every other week, you'll get some bonus content there. And that's been a lot of fun. You also get a preview of the podcast, uh, I send out the show notes, usually the weekend prior, so not only do you get all the show notes sent to you with all these links that I keep talking about that are in the show notes, uh, you, you also get to see the custom artwork that I do for every single show that most people never see. Because uh, unless you go to my podcast website, most podcast apps don't show the individual show artwork. So you'll get to see that. And, you know, you'll get a, you'll get a sneak peek at, what, at what's coming up on, uh, on Monday. Now, at the Knight Errant level, I've added some really cool new things. And this is kind of what I want to focus on here. So our, to me, the Knight Errant level is kind of like the... These are people that I that are also kind of in some sort of way, you know, an educator or an advocate or somehow in the security and privacy space or somebody who really, really cares about it uh, and wants to know more. Like they like what I, what I do every week, but, you know, they kind of wish I'd, I'd read that extra article or go a little deeper or talk about the more technical aspects of things. And so I'm trying to focus a lot of benefits in that direction. And to that end, I've started a new biweekly podcast bonus that I'm calling Merlin's Musings. And it's for more technical content. For instance, I just started this. The very first one I talked about using web REST APIs and how you could do that with Python and, and special tools that will let you set up developer accounts and query your accounts to get information so that you can post-process that information. I'm also going to be doing one on how to pick locks uh, and, and you know probably do some stuff about hacking and, and, and other stuff like that. So I'm really excited about that. Also, as I'm doing the news shows every week, as I'm putting together the articles like I did for this week, and I probably did, I don't, I don't know, 10 articles today. For the 10 articles I read, there was 20 articles I didn't, or maybe 30. Through the two weeks, I'm constantly monitoring different sources for privacy and security stories and, and marking these as potential candidates for uh, being news articles. But I, I can't. I just, I mean, I can't get to them all. That means I don't get to some. And I have now started compiling that complete list, the full candidate list. So basically, it's a custom curated list of privacy and security stories, some of which I read on the air, but most of which, honestly, I, I don't get to, that I send to you every two weeks. You know, when I'm doing the podcast and I'm making my list, you get the fullest of everything. And then finally, one more thing that I've started is I have started a book club. Now, this is not your regular fiction book club, which I'm sure some of you may have done. But 
I know that I have so many privacy and security books that I want to read, some of which are fiction, but honestly, most are nonfiction. They're still interesting. They're not dry like textbooks. You know, like the one we're reading right now that I just started is called The Art of Invisibility, and it's by world-renowned hacker Kevin Mitnick. And it's how to protect your privacy on the web. Um, and so that's our first book, and, and we're reading it right now. And I've got a long list of other books. And of course, I'm taking input from my patrons as well. We'll, we'll put together this this list of books, and you know, every couple months or so, I'll pick a new one, and we will read it together. And all of these levels uh, for patrons have got a Discord benefit, and that is an online private chat service, private in the sense that not everybody can see it. Uh, unfortunately, it's not end in encrypted. I wish it was, but uh, it's at least you know you know protected by passwords and whatever. And where I discuss all this stuff with my patrons, and at each level, you get access to more rooms, and including the uh, the new book club room for my knight's errant. So this is just some of the stuff I've been doing. I'm trying to add more. I'm open to other ideas. I've gotten a lot of these ideas actually from my patrons of things I want, I might want to add. And I want to create this community. I want to reach out to you guys. It's, it's, you know, it's all well and good for me to doing this podcast, but I really like some give and take. I like, you know, getting feedback from you guys and discord's a great way to do that. And I really, I really enjoy the opportunity having direct interaction with, with my patrons. So now for the promotion, uh, real quick, it's going to be running for the next four weeks. It's going to end on Tuesday, June 14th, and I'm going to be giving away challenge coins. If you sign up, if you're a new sign up at the Castle Guard level, you will get one of my challenge coins. Uh, if you sign up at the Knight Errant level, you will get two challenge coins in the color finish of your choice. If you have not seen these things, you need to go to my show notes and find the link to the challenge coins and check them out. They are really, really cool. Again, I've given these to some people who get lots of challenge coins in their area of work. And many of them have told me these are some of the coolest challenge coins they've ever gotten. And also, if you sign up at the Knight Errant level, I'm going to give you the chance to do the little intro thing. Like if you've listened to my interview shows and I have the guests say, hi, this is so-and-so and you're listening to Firewall Stone and Stop Dragons, I will let you do one of those and you can have, do a custom intro to the show if you want. It's optional. You don't have to. A lot of my Knight Errants have not done that in the past. Uh, also, if you want, if maybe a different angle, if you want, I will announce your knighthood to uh, the realm. In other words, I will announce your name on the show as a new knight errant. So again, optional, you don't have to if you don't want to, but uh, you know, hey, just another fun thing that I am doing for this promotion. So anyway, I'll say, I'll say more about the next coming weeks. Uh, go to patreon.com and search for firewalls, don't stop dragons, or go to the show notes and find the link uh, to get more info. I'll probably have a blog article on it soon with more details. Check all of that out if you're at all interested. Now would be there's never been a better time to be a patron. Literally, these are some really cool new things I've added uh, that are brand new. And there's only 100 of these challenge coins on the planet, folks. And if uh, for some reason I happen to meet you in person and you produce that coin, it's worth a free drink on me. All right, so I got some great interviews uh, in the hopper. As I said, I've got an interview with uh, Derek Hansen, who's a VP of Yupco, that'll be coming up soon. I've got a great one on cryptocurrency with Seth uh, from Seth for Privacy. And uh, next week will be one from Anthony Collette. And we talk about some passwords and even some more esoteric cryptographic things like one time pads. And he has some really fascinating historical perspectives on some of these things uh, and about how you know, he and his company believe that having the right physical representation for some of these security things is what really makes them accessible. So lots of great interviews coming. If you have not subscribed, be sure you do it that way. You won't miss any of this goodness. And again, check out the promotion at patreon.com. All right, everybody, that's it. Take care out there. Stay safe. And until next week, don't get caught with your drawbridge down.